this video, Mike explains why the Bible sometimes seems so hard to understand when it comes to the end times. Some of the key points. The Bible is written both to conceal truth and reveal truth. It's meant to be understood, but only by those who are willing to search it out in faith. Thankfully, there is a key to understanding the scriptures, and it is to rightly divide the word of truth. The Bible describes many things which are similar, but the key is to look at the differences. One of the most important differences to recognize is the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Even the disciples were confused about Christ's first coming because they didn't understand this difference, and they confused events relating to the first coming with events related to the second coming. I remember when I discovered years ago the book uh, Pre-Wrath Rapture. Uh, it challenged what I believed because I was raised to, uh, was taught pre-tribulational, pre-millennial doctrine. But I came to doubt everything I was taught and wanted to prove it for myself. So I uh, became a student of the Word. And uh, I, read, I read more books, uh, things I didn't believe, than what I did believe. I, I found it more valuable to study people with different ideas than to try to study the ones that already believed what I did and simply to confirm my belief. So I, I got the Pre-Wrath Rapture by Rosenthal. And so I decided to just dismiss my views and uh, let him convince me of what he was saying. So I read it as one who would want to believe it. I felt that was the most objective way to do it. And I looked at every one of his arguments, and I got all the way through it. And when I say I read it, I mean I took a pen and I marked it and studied it and looked up all the verses. So I went through it a second time or immediately to make sure that I hadn't, hadn't missed anything and looked at it very carefully. And I concluded <laughs> Rosenthal was off of his rocker. He just totally missed the words of God. In fact, what I discovered was that he went Bible shopping. There were passages that he couldn't deal with that taught things different from what his position was. And so he, he searched through the 300 and something English Bibles and found one rare one that agreed with the position he wanted to take. And so he didn't just use one version. He skipped around the different versions because they're not alike. They're all different. They have to be at least 10% different uh, in order to get a copyright on them. And that's the purpose, to get a copyright and sell books. And so he would find one that suited his position. And so <laughs> I dismissed the pre-wrath rapture simply because it's not biblical. Uh, it does not make biblical sense, and it just overlooks so much scripture. So uh, I'm pre-tribulational, pre-millennial, and I have good reasons. So we're going to answer the question people have been asking, why is the Bible so hard to understand? There's some people believe pre-trib, some mid-trib, some post-trib, some no-trib at all. Some premillennial, postmillennial, amillennial, and then there's that panmillennial. It'll all pan out. I don't know what position to take. And so which one is true? Which one is the correct position? Uh, it's hard to understand. Why is the Bible not clear? Why doesn't God just have a little section of theology? And he says, okay, the correct position is, and then he delineates the correct position. Uh, why is it difficult to understand? That's what I'm going to answer. Or put it another way, why isn't the Bible clear about the rapture and second coming? Why do some people say this verse teaches the rapture? Some people say it teaches the second coming. And then uh, the people who have a rapture position, there seem to be verses that contradict them. And then people who have a pre-tribulational, pre-rapture uh, uh, position, or people who have a post-tribulational rapture position, uh, all of them seem to have verses that contradict them. So it's like you got a lot of these confusing passages that say different things about the supposedly same event. So why is that so? Well, this, this is going to be fun to answer. You're going to see some things you never saw before. You're going to see with clarity things you've never understood. All right. The reason the Bible is confusing is because it was written to be confusing. Jesus spoke so as to confuse. The Bible is written to do two things. Number one, conceal truth. And number two, reveal truth. In other words, it's written in code. If you received a message in code written to someone else, you'd look at it and say, this is confusing. It doesn't make any sense. That's because you're supposed to be reading every eighth word, not every word. So that's code. Uh, sometimes codes are binary. Sometimes they come across other ways. Well, the Bible has its own code, its own unique usage of words and phrases 
that can be broken, that are intended to be broken. You're intended to understand. You're intended to get the key of knowledge and interpret the Bible. But uh, listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, 7. He said, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom. In other words, God has hidden his wisdom, wrapped it up in a mystery, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So Paul admitted, in fact, the word mystery appears 27 times in the New Testament. It all refers to things that God has kept secret and has parceled out that truth to people who have his spirit, to people who believe his word, and kept that truth concealed from people who don't believe. So the Bible is a beautiful code, and uh, you're going to have the key of knowledge. Now, Jesus also answered the question. The disciples came unto him saying, why, why speak us out unto them in parables? This is Matthew 13, 10. So the disciples didn't understand a lot of what Jesus said. They made that clear. They, they were always asking him to explain that to us. So they said, why are you speaking to them in parables? Why aren't you plain? Why aren't you straightforward? He answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries, there's that word again, of the kingdom of heaven, but them it's not given. So the answer to their question, why aren't you clear? Why are you speaking in parables? His answer was because it's not given unto them to understand the things I'm saying. You're supposed to understand it, but they're not. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, that who is knowledge, will be given knowledge, who, that he'll have more abundance, but unto whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. So the Bible is written to, <laughs> to take away what you think you know and leave you devoid of understanding if your heart's not in the right place, uh, if you don't have the key of knowledge. Wherefore, speak out to them in parables, Jesus said, because seeing they see not, they, 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 they look, they see, but they don't see. Hearing they hear not, they hear the words, but they don't hear it. Neither do they understand. People say, well, I don't understand. Well, that's a self-indictment to say you don't understand. That's an admission of a failure to investigate or a heart that's unwilling to believe. He said, blessed are your eyes to the disciples, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. So the disciples did see and hear and understand, and still they do today. Now, in John 16, 25, he said, these things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, Jesus said to the disciples, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. So Jesus confessed here that he wasn't being plain he was wrapping up the truths in Proverbs so that even his own disciples were missing some of the points. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now thou speakest plainly. In other words, they say, you hadn't been speaking plainly up until now, but you just did. And uh, you'd have to read that whole context, John 16, 25 through 29, and, and, and greater than that to get it all. Now, Matthew eleven twenty five. 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth. I love it. Uh, now, he's thanking the Father for what? Because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent. Uh, Jesus thanks God, the Father, that he hid these truths. The truths that are found in the book of Revelation. This painting that I did, this is a reproduction of about an eight, nine foot long painting. So he said, I thank you that you hid these things from the wise and prudent. Why isn't the book of Revelation easy to be understood? Because it's written so as not to be easy. It's written with code. The book of Daniel is a code breaker for the book of Revelation. The book of Zechariah is a code breaker. Habakkuk is a code breaker. Psalms is a code breaker. Even the book of Genesis are code breaking books that open up to us the meaning of the book of Revelation. So it's not supposed to be easy to get. It's like I, uh, people have these uh, hunts where they hide things and they have these little clues and, and uh, people go around from clue to clue to finally come up with the prize. The, Bi the Bible is, is written, so you'll have to investigate. It's character building to do so, and it's also a whole lot of fun to discover for yourself the great truths of the Word of God. He said, you've hid these things from the wise and prudent and has revealed them unto babes. Just people with simple minds like children, they understand them. Even so, Father, so it seemed good in thy sight. 
So <laughs> here's the disciples and Jesus confessing to the Bible being written in mysteries. Now, so what is the key to deciphering the Bible? Jesus said unto Luke eleven fifty two, Woe unto you lawyers. So he's talking to the smart guys. For you've taken away the key of knowledge. That's not very complimentary. You entered not in yourselves, that's into the kingdom of heaven, and them that were entering in, you hindered. So he said the smart lawyers, a lawyer in the, this sense was one who studied the law of God, one who studied the Moses and the Old Testament writings. Uh, most of these guys had it memorized from beginning to end. They knew every word, jot, and tittle that was in the Bible. You take out one little jot and they'd know that it was missing and it upset them very greatly. And yet, he said, you took away the key of knowledge. You didn't go in. You missed it. You didn't unlock the door. After, with all that knowledge, they didn't have the key. So what was the key? Well, p different people have speculated, and I, I can't say for certain, but I know one thing that's the key. They, they had a failure to understand the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. You see, there are eight kingdoms. In fact, I wrote a book, and I remember to bring it with me. I wrote a book called Eight Kingdoms, and it goes into great detail showing you the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And uh, I've got side-by-side uh, -side graphs and charts and diagrams showing you the scriptures in parallel, uh, showing you parables that are alike but different, explaining how the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are different. The disciples didn't know that. And if you don't know the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, you're certainly going to be confused about all of these events. Because the kingdom of God is here. See where I've written the kingdom of God? The kingdom of heaven is here during the great tribulation. The kingdom of heaven was back here before the cross offered. The kingdom of God came on the day of Pentecost and will exist up until the rapture when the kingdom of heaven begins again. If you don't know the difference, you're going to have a lot of trouble. All right? Uh, now, there are two, the, the Bible is confusing. <laughs> <laughs> for this reason, many, but let me give you several. Number one, there are the, 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 the apostles and the Pharisees and lawyers were confused about two things, the first coming and the second coming of Christ. When they read the scriptures, they read of Christ coming as a child, but they also read of him coming as a king to reign and to conquer. That's why the disciples said unto Jesus, Will thou at this time restore again the kingdom unto Israel? They were expecting a fight. They were expecting a war. They were expecting him to conquer the nations and subdue their enemies and, and give them freedom. Give me liberty or give me death. They were libertarian patriots, and they wanted to be freed from the dictates of a wicked Roman empire. So the Bible seemed to promise that, and yet it, it talked about a suffering, sacrificial lamb. So they didn't understand the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And so they were confused because the Bible predicted two comings, and they took it to be one. Now, Peter on the first day of Pentecost uh, says this, But this is they which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So he's going back to Joel. Now he quotes Joel. So he's describing the event with the many languages that the people are speaking in. He said, Joel described this. It shall come to pass, Joel said, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on the servants and handmaidens will I pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Now, all that, was obviously taking place on the day of Pentecost. But then that's verse 18. Verse 19, the very next verse, Joel goes on and says, and Peter's quoting it, I will show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Now, that, that hadn't happened, and it certainly wasn't happening on the day of Pentecost. There was no blood, fire, and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness. Got it painted right there, right here. 
and the moon before the coming of the great and notable day of the Lord. So here's the coming. And also uh, down here at the end of the millennium is the coming of the great and notable day of the Lord. So they were confused about that. And it shall come to pass that whoso shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So Peter read the scriptures and the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, described the first coming with the uh, coming of Jesus Christ and the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And it immediately jumps and describes the second coming in wrath, blood and fire and smoke. Now, Peter probably at that time still didn't understand the difference. He too was confused about the two comings of Christ. Now, you can understand why that would create confusion if you took that to be uh, all happening at one time. Now, there are two creation counts that people conflate, and that confuses people. The Bible in the book of Peter talks about the world then being overflow with water, and they think that's Noah's flood. They don't realize that there was a flood before Noah's flood. There was a flood before Genesis chapter 1, verse 3 and following, before the six days of creation. There was a flood that destroyed this earth. Jeremiah talks about it. But uh, if you don't understand the two creation accounts, then you won't understand the two floods, Noah's flood and the pre-flood. And then there, there are two testaments people conflate. You've got a lot of Judaizers today that don't know the difference between the Old and the New Testament. Some of them want to live in the Old Testament, some the New, some kind of in between somewhere. So there's a conflation of the two testaments. There's also a, a conflation of eschatological, that's a, a word I learned in college, don't use it much, eschatological, end time study. Uh, okay, the first coming is confused with the rapture of the church, confused with the rapture of the tribulation saints at the end of the tribulation, uh, they're confused with the second coming of Christ, and confused with the end of the world judgment that occurs after the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ upon the earth. So when, when you don't when you don't rightly divide these different comings, these different eschatological events, then it's going to be real confusing. We're going to show you in the scripture uh, them side by side. And then people confuse the judgments that are to come. The Bible speaks of the judgment seat of Christ, which is up here. It also speaks of the great white throne judgment, which is right here. It's written there, great white throne judgment. And they confuse it with the, ju uh, the judgment seat of Christ, great white throne judgment, and then with the judgment of the nations that occurs at the end of the tribulation when he separates the sheep from the goats. If you try to put all those together, it's going to look contradictory and make the Bible hard to understand. But if you rightly divide the word of truth, it stops being difficult. Now, uh, in fact, Peter's, uh, Timothy says, uh, Peter says this to Timothy, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Uh, a lot of people spend their whole life studying the Bible, and then they end up ashamed uh, with the false doctrines they come up. He said, rightly dividing the word of truth. Wow, rightly dividing. That means that you need to divide the Old Testament from the New Testament. You need to divide the gospel of the kingdom of heaven Jesus preached and the disciples preached in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 from the gospel that Paul preached and that was preached by the apostles after the resurrection. You need to divide the rapture from the second coming. You need to divide present tribulation from future great tribulation. The Bible is full of similar but different events that need to be divided into the proper place uh, and so designated in your thinking if you're going to understand the Word of God.